Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. David Cohn, the Chief Medical Officer of the James Cancer Hospital at Ohio State. And today we're going to talk about COVID-19 and cancer, important information for our patients and especially those immunocompromised patients. Um, this is the second time that I've done this and hopefully it was enjoyable and educational. Uh, there were a lot of questions that resulted from the last presentation that specifically address questions related to what's up with the immune system, how do our immune systems affect COVID-19 risk, and how are the immune systems uh, in cancer patients in particular affected? And so we're gonna go over some points here. First of all, uh, so follow up on something that I said last week, what does it mean to be immunocompromised? Our immune systems are a component of our body that fights infection or other conditions. And when somebody is immune compromised, it means their immune systems do not work as effectively as they typically would. And there's a lot of reasons why people have an affected or decreased immune system, one of which is cancer and the other of which is cancer treatment. And that's why this is particularly important uh, when it's related to COVID-19. Um, the reason why COVID-19 is a higher risk in individuals that are immunocompromised is that the immune systems, as I said, fight off infection. And so COVID-19 is a viral infection. And these types of viruses, uh, the coronaviruses, are typically identified by our immune systems. And they are basically eliminated from our system because they're recognized as being foreign. And so when our immune systems are compromised, we don't have the ability to fight off infection as effectively. And so cancer in and of itself causes the immune system to not function as well. And secondly, the treatment of cancer, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation, can also decrease the immune system's effectiveness. Um, so the question becomes, what type of cancer affects the immune system? Uh, are there some that are more commonly uh, lead to immunocompromise or immunodeficiency than others? And the answer is clearly yes. So our immune cells are made within the bone marrow. So there are certain ca cancers that arise from the bone marrow, and these are our typical blood cancers like lymphoma, leukemia, and multiple myeloma, that very often the bone marrow that creates the immune cells uh, can be displaced by the cancer. And so what happens is, is that as these cancers tend to grow within those cells, it forces out our normal immune cells, and that makes our immune systems not function as effectively. So from that standpoint, blood cancers lead someone's immune system to be decreased relative to other types of cancers. But again, all cancers can affect the immune systems negatively, such that anybody with cancer has a weakened or a decreased immune system. More common solid tumors, uh, you know, breast cancer, lung cancer, colorectal cancer. With these cancers, again, they don't start in the bone marrow where the immune systems are made, so it doesn't quite cause the level of immunodeficiency or immunocompromise as does with blood cancers themselves. So, um, one of the questions that came up from a couple of individuals last week was how long after treatment should patients be expected to be immunocompromised? And that's a really hard question to address with a single answer, except for to say that depending upon the type of cancer you have, as we talked about before, and secondly, as it's related to the treatment of the cancer, what type of chemotherapy or radiation therapy does somebody have can substantially increase the duration of time that somebody has immunocompromise. So for example, if somebody has a bone marrow transplantation for a blood cancer, the principle behind that is that you entirely destroy a patient's immune system and eliminate all the cancer as well. And then you repopulate the immune system with the transplanted cells. And when that happens, uh, that's the time in which you can have a much more prolonged period of time of immunocompromise compared to individuals that didn't have chemotherapy treatment, for example, that entirely eliminates the immune cells within the bone marrow. So it really depends upon the type of treatment that somebody gets. And the other part is that different patients have a different response in terms of the duration of time that their blood cells are affected with the same type of chemotherapy. So if you got two patients, they get the same exact chemotherapy. One patient might have a drop in their blood counts, including their infection fighting cells for months while the other recovers within a few weeks. And so information like that is really important when you're deciding at what point in time your immune system is back to normal. And I would just encourage everybody to bring this question up with your healthcare providers, because again, it's a very individual decision. 
as to when somebody would deem their immune system back to normal health. And so why is that important? Um, as we're dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it's really critical to recognize that the immune system's ability to fight off the infection is compromised with cancer and cancer treatment. And during this period of time, it's really important that we do the things that everyone's been talking about, is physical distancing from others so that you can control your environment and minimize the chance that you're around individuals that have any type of infection, including COVID-19. And second, you wanna make sure that you're washing your hands. Soap and water is really critically important. And if you don't have access to soap and water, then alcohol-based hand sanitizer is really important to ensure that if you picked up something from the community, that you're in a position that you eliminate that with soap water or with hand, alcohol-based hand sanitizer. So while somebody's immune system is, is decreased, just really, really critical to make sure that we're all doing the things that we can do to protect ourselves from getting COVID-19, especially if you've got cancer and especially if that cancer has been treated with chemotherapy or with radiation therapy. So the good news is that after treatment in general, immune systems recover back to normal level of health and we're in a position where we can go back in the community and do the things that we typically would do. Um, and in that circumstance, you know, it is a it is a place where we can, you know, make sure that we do our physical distancing, wash our hands, um, but the risk of contracting COVID-19 or complications from COVID-19 are a lot less. So let's talk about something also that's come up, uh, and this is for cancer patients in particular, is that what's the importance of undergoing procedures that our doctors think are necessary? And I think this is a really, really important uh, question to try to address because there's a lot of communication from the federal government and from hospitals as well about cancellation of elective surgeries. And so that's a really narrow window of things that are, that are being canceled, which are things that if you waited for a month or three months, there would be no change in anybody's health outcome. The cancer wouldn't get worse quality of life wouldn't worsen as well. These are elective procedures that it doesn't really matter when they're done as long as they're done at some point. Short of that, and especially for cancer patients, procedures that are scheduled are generally not elective and other things like blood tests and x-rays are done for a specific reason. Either they're done to follow somebody's response to treatment or to follow their cancer's uh, response to treatment as well. So if your doctor or your healthcare provider are recommending that you have a treatment or an evaluation with a blood test or an x-ray done, it's really, really important that we're in a position where those blood tests or those x-rays are continued, and especially those surgeries, if they're deemed not elective, then it's really important to go through with them. From our side on the hospital, you'll see that we are all masked, uh, just as we are in the community, as the CDC has recommended that we all have access to a mask when we're out in public, we're doing our part to make sure that our patients are healthy so that you can feel safe within our environment as well. And so the last topic that I wanna to mention before I open this up to questions, if there are any, so please keep those questions coming, um, is how can people protect their patients with whom they live? So let's say that, for example, uh, you're a caregiver for a patient who's got cancer. Uh, what is it that you can do to make sure that you're caring for an individual as safely as possible? And again, it's going to sound like that same thing over and over again, which is control one's environment. Uh, you want to make sure that if you're caring for a cancer patient or any patient at home whose immune system may be weaker, that you're out shopping for them and that you are bringing groceries back to them. Really important to try to minimize the chance that that individual is going to be out in the community and contracting something that you can avoid by taking care of them in a different way. Likewise, when you're home, hand washing with soap and water, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, those are really the key pieces. I don't want to think though, I don't want everybody to think that we don't want people to go out of their homes. That certainly is important. Getting regular exercise is critically important for the health of any patient, uh, any person, especially any patient and especially any cancer patient, so that you're in a position to make sure that your physical body is in the best condition it can be in. You know, wearing a mask is important. Staying away from individuals that aren't part of your nuclear group or family or those with whom you live is really important. And then the second component of that is making sure that you're uh, not just physically, but psychologically in the right place. Take some time for yourself, make sure to focus on mindfulness as well, because again, this is really stressful for everybody. Cancer is stressful for everybody. Uh, COVID-19 is stressful for everybody. 
you put those two things together and in that circumstance you get extra stress so make sure you take care of yourselves so that wraps it up for my points um i'll take a couple questions and then uh, hopefully be able to do this again next week uh you know monday at 10 15 eastern seems like a reasonable time for me and hopefully this works for everybody else but i appreciate everybody's support um and you know again take care of yourselves take care of each other and we'll get all we'll all get through this so question from the group is can a friend go to the stephanie spielman comprehensive breast center um, with a patient for treatment and radiation or are they discouraging this so the visitor policy is a really important component of what we're doing to control one's environment. As of last week, the entire Wexner Medical Center that includes the James Cancer Hospital and the clinics has eliminated all outpatient visitation, except for the exceptions of new patients and known discussions that are very challenging like end of life discussions. So short of that, a routine visit to a clinic or for chemotherapy is not allowed with a visitor. Um, we're doing everything we can to make sure that there still is communication such that there is either a telephone or a video chat option at the end of a at the end of an examination or at the end of an infusion to make sure that we are connecting with those visitors that brought that individual uh, to that clinic. It's a really, really hard decision. Again, I can't express how difficult it was from our side to make that decision, but it's also the right thing to control our environment and to minimize the chance of having anybody exposed unnecessarily. Um, the more we can do to control that environment, the better off we'll all be. Um, there were also questions about research. What's going on with research? And I would just say that there's a lot of holds that are put on um, non-essential research. So if we're doing research studies that improve the quality of life or improve the care of our patients, these are ongoing. But if we're trying to answer a scientific question that we're not sure if it helps or not, then what we're trying to do is to minimize the chance that patients end up coming into our clinics for research studies for cancer, unless we know that they're gonna be helpful. So again, it just back, gets back to controlling one's environment, minimizing the chance that anybody is unnecessarily exposed to other individuals uh, who may have COVID. So that's the overall structure and the goal is to play it safe. We'll get through this. Um, it'll happen in the near future, we hope. And during that period of time, again, everybody be safe, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and, uh, and we'll all get through this. So thanks for listening. Keep questions coming. Uh, if I didn't address them last week or this week, we'll hopefully be able to get to them uh, as we go through this together. Thanks all.